I came to the realization that no one ever actually finds a great church. You never find those. What you have to do is create those. Because in the end, if you're wanting to find one, you're looking for someone else to put on everything you need, to create everything you want, to do it all for you, to, to make it so someone else has done all the work and you get to walk in and sort of enjoy the fruit of their labor and say, oh yeah, this all fits me really nice, I'll stay here but it won't take long at all for that to fade for you because in the end, your active participation, your own spiritual journey, mixing and mingling in the, in the mud and the sweat and the toil with other people, that's what the spiritual journey is. You have to create the perfect church. You can't find it. In Acts chapter 2, in uh, verse 42, there's just a beginning of a little stretch of when the church was first formed and the power of God was moving mightily and thousands of people were coming and they were trying to assimilate into this single church. At that time, there was no other church on the planet. There was one. You didn't get to say, well, I'm going to go be a Baptist or I'm a Presbyterian or I'm a Lutheran. No such things existed. You couldn't even say, I'm going to go to the church across town. There was no other church across town. There was one church and everybody came into, into it together and they came into it fast and furious. And there was four things that everybody did. And those four things began to create the seed of what real church looks and feels like. And when they got it right, that would, the consequence of that would be that six results would take place. And they're found real simple in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And I'll kind of back up a little bit uh, to verse 41. It says, those who accepted this message, Peter had just preached, were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So in one sermon, the church went from, well, there's you know, 120 of us in an upper room, a few hangers on here and there, some folks that followed Jesus, and you know, we got this small little group. Imagine, we're not even 120 here right now, right? We're probably about 95, 100 people in the room right now. And imagine that, you know, <laughs> and that would be a big imagination. Imagine I preached a sermon, and the next day 3,000 people showed up. Said, okay, we're in, we're in, right? 3,000 people, we'd be like, well, what do we do with all these people? What's this going to look like? What are we going to do with ourselves? And how do we spend our time? And what activities are important? And what are, what's not important? And in the next passage, it tells you the four activities that were the only important activities of the church. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. In verse 42, we get right off the bat. Here's what it is. Uh, the four things that they're going to do, they're going to devote themselves to these four things. All the other stuff would, might come and add later, but if you do these four things, these are the core things of what makes a church happen. And I think it's probably good for us to embrace them and say, hey, if we want the gathering house to really become something, maybe we go back to the roots and we embrace these four things. The first thing they said is they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And that was because these apostles are the ones who had hung out with Jesus the most. They spent the most time with him. They had the private time. They got the benefit of having Jesus be a, pull them aside offline and explain sermons he'd done. They had direct insight from Jesus that the masses didn't have. Jesus is the Son of God, so if he's going to speak, everything he said was true. And everything he spoke was reality. He was reforming the whole nature of who is God and how do we relate to him. And so everybody who came after said, well, here's the thing. If we want to know what Jesus said, what Jesus taught, we got to ask these 12 who were with him, these 12 handpicked. It's why somebody else couldn't come into the community later and say, well, I know God just as much as you do. I'm coming out of Spain, and I've been over there studying every day I can about God, so let me come into the church and tell you what the doctrine should be. Everybody would look at him and say, you know, we don't really care what you studied, because what we care about is, what did Jesus say, the very Son of God? And when the Son of God has spoken, we listen, we follow, and we say, yes, Lord. And so here we are in the modern era, and that means if we're going to devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching, it means everything that's written in this book is what we follow. We follow what the Bible says, how it's laid out, what it explains. It's why modern era, someone can't come along and say, well, I think something different. It's like, cool, we're following the apostles' teaching, no. We're going back to the groundwork of those who followed and walked and worked, were with Jesus. When they first put the Bible together, it one of the criteria of why these letters made it into the Bible and why others didn't. Any letter that made it into the Bible in the New Testament had to be written by or under the authority of an apostle. If an apostle had not written the book or had not been uh, directly related to the writing of the book, like the Gospel of Mark, which Mark wasn't an apostle, but we know from the early church fathers, Peter told the story, Mark wrote it down. So only the apostles' writing, those writings sanctioned by the apostles were the ones that could make it into the Bible. It's why you couldn't get what modern people call the lost books of the Bible. There's no such thing as the lost books of the Bible. There was other stuff written, but it's like, hey, that guy was not an apostle. That guy didn't walk with Jesus. That guy wasn't handpicked. That guy wasn't in the inner circle. So we don't really care what he has to say. 
We're following the apostles' teaching because the only voice that matters is Jesus' voice. And so that was the first thing. They devoted themselves to studying. What did he say? What did he do? How did he see it? And that's why later on in the New Testament would say that the, the church is laid on the foundation of the prophets and the apostles. On and on it would go. So in the modern era, it's like, well, that means kind of we got to spend time studying this and looking at this. We've got to spend our time saying, what does this mean? And, you know, I mean, if you've picked up a Bible and read it, it's really not easy reading. You know, it's like it's confusing sometimes. And it's like, what the heck is going on here? So it's helpful to get together with other people and say, well, let's study this. Let's talk about it. What have you learned that I haven't learned? And so that's why doing things like getting together offline midweek and meeting with some partners and studying the Bible is a great thing to do. As the new year rolls in, we're going to be offering some additional classes and different things are happening. And um, we may be having a women's theology study happening, and we're not sure of the night yet, but Shelly's over there, and she's like, yeah, I've been just hungry for some deeper theology, maybe get some women together and do that. Uh, we're talking about a men's group bill starting in January, that kind of thing. I'm going to do a class after the new year, four-part series of where'd the Bible come from? How do you know that what you're reading today is what John really wrote? Why these books and no others? How much of it is God's word? All of it, some of it, part of it, Right? I'm going to do a class for each of those things we address. So we'll be doing a lot of that kind of stuff. I encourage you, don't just think Sunday church will be enough. If you're going to devote yourselves to the apostles' teaching, it's going to take more than an hour and a half service on a Sunday morning. So that's one thing. The next thing it said is fellowship. Fellowship's kind of a bygone word. And Lord of the Rings sort of revived it, thank God, because it, was, it had passed into our society as one of those sissy words that only Christians used, Right? Let's have fellowship, sweet fellowship. We're having a fellowship time after the service. No one ever had that, you know. No business has ever said, okay, business is over. We're going to have a fellowship now. No one ever talked like that. Only churches talk like that. And uh, so they kind of revived it with Lord of the Rings because it's a great word, actually. The original, the actual Greek word used there is koinonia. And it actually means intimacy. Uh, it's often translated in other passages in the Bible as sharing, a partaker to participate with it. It means you're, you're doing something with each other. You're sharing each other's lives and thoughts and understanding your own journey and hearing other people's stories and sharing your story with them. There's an intimacy with it. And so when they get together for fellowship, it doesn't mean they just sit beside each other in a church service and listen to one guy give them a lecture. What it meant was we know each other. We're hanging out with each other. We're talking to each other. We're, we're spending time hearing about each other's sorrows and pains and hurts and joys and talents and abilities. That's what fellowship is. I love the one thing that's cool about when Lord of the Rings revived that word fellowship was cool because it meant that they were on a mission that was greater than themselves. Yeah, that's what we should be, right? And it created a bond of unity among a diverse group in order to save the world. Oh yeah, that's cool too. And it was a difficult adventure and some might perish. Yeah, not so good there, right? But that's true in the church as well. We are on an incredible adventure a cosmic adventure of heaven and hell and the cosmos and human beings playing out and eternity is on the line and some might perish, but the adventure is worth the battle. And in the Lord of the Rings, the other thing that was cool is that the fellowship put their personal desires aside for the greater good. I like that word fellowship. So if we want to be the kind of church that's really going to grow and become something, if we're going to be the kind of church you really need, maybe not the church you want, it's going to require you actively participating in fellowship, intimacy, laying your personal desires aside for the greater good, being on a mission, sharing your story and hearing other people's stories, being authentic with each other. Otherwise, we're just doing a show on Sunday morning and we're an entertainment venue. The third thing they devoted themselves to was the breaking of bread. Some translations say the Lord's Supper there, but actually the breaking of bread was what they were doing. Um, it's interesting, we don't, we don't have this in modern times because we can run down to Safeway and buy bread and be done, go home, you know, ah, bread went bad, throw it away, right? No big deal to us. But in ancient times, getting bread was a big deal. You didn't run down to the store and buy bread. It wasn't manufactured by massive combines owned by corporations who genetically modified the seeds and added fertilizer to it so they could make sure that a certain acreage would yield so much harvest and they had so much that it would overflow and rot and get rid of it. And that wasn't the way it worked in ancient times. In ancient times, you were responsible for your own bread. You either somehow manufactured it yourself and found a way to buy the flour, or you actually grew the grain, raised the crop, you kept the pestilence off of it, you, kept the, this, you made sure the seeds were good, you would have to save so many seeds for next year's harvest, you would take the grain itself and you would be the one who would cut the stalks, you would have to separate the seed from the chaff, you would have to be the one to grind it, you would have to turn it into flour, and then you would have to protect that flour from raiders who would come and try to steal it from you. 
And then you would have to protect it from mice and bugs who would try to get into it. And then at the end, you would have to take that flour and you would have to mix it all up, knead the bread, wait the hours for it to rise, throw it in the oven, bake it, and get your bread. So when you devote yourself to the breaking of bread together, you're like, imagine you got a loaf of bread and you did all that. You're like, I ain't sharing this. You know how much went into this loaf of bread? I am not giving up my bread for anybody. I have worked months and weeks, and I had to fight off grasshoppers and locusts and raiders who came and tried to take it. I've spent hours sitting and waiting and grinding this stuff. I am not sharing this with just anybody. You better be somebody special for me to share my bread with you. It's why in ancient times, the eating of bread and salt in a home meant that the host of that home was duty-bound to protect you with their life. So the idea of going into someone's home for a visit, one of the first things they did is they broke off a piece of bread, they dip it in salt, salt, another commodity that was hard to come by, And when they ate it, it meant inside this home, we are intimate partners and companions, and I am duty-bound to protect you with my life. When the church got together and it says they broke bread together, they didn't just run down to Safeway and buy some and threw away what didn't work. You understand, this is like, oh, this is a big deal. This is a group of people saying we are intimately involved and all of our resources, our energy, our time, our effort, everything we got, we're going to give to each other. We're going to share it and share it alike and we will be duty bound to protect each other with our lives. And the early church devoted themselves to breaking bread together. That says something, doesn't it? And you know what? You want to be in a perfect church? It means it's going to cost you some. It means it's something you got to put into it. It means it's going to require some sacrifice. It's going to mean that you personally are duty-bound to protect and love and cherish and take care of the other people sitting in the room. It's like, yeah, I didn't really want that. I just wanted some nice songs, a quick prayer, a nice sermon to inspire me, and out the door I go. Well, that's what most of us have been doing, right? But that's not what a cool church is. Real church has all this stuff. The fourth thing, they did the apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread. The fourth thing they devoted themselves to was prayer. Everyone constantly believed that God was present and they were actively concerned about, that he was actively concerned about people. It's pr- pretty hard to imagine. I mean, they did church every day. The early church did it every day. And they believed God is present in us. He is present with us. He is in the room. And what's more, God actually wants to do something with us. God's more excited to do miracles for us than we are about having miracles done. God's more excited to fulfill his mission, Jesus' mission, which was to open the eyes of the blind and release the prisoners trapped in darkness and to set the prisoners free. Jesus is more excited to do his mission than we are excited to do his mission. The early church devoted themselves to prayer because they knew God was there and they expected him to answer the prayers. Us, not so much. You know, us, we're more like, well, we're modern Americans. You know, we got wealth and resources. We have technology. We have an internet. We seek our answers. We go through all of our answers. We exhaust everything we have. We talk to everybody we know who's smart and wise and informed, or we borrow money from each other, whatever we got to do. And then at the last moment when we've exhausted every potentiality to solve our problem, well, I guess I better pray about it, right? Last ditch effort. Early church was like, oh no, that's first effort. First effort is to get in the trenches and expect God to do something. And what was cool is they gave each other blessings, right? And a blessing would be, if I had something in my power to give you, I would give it. That's what a blessing is. So you can bless somebody with this. I know you had an abysmal father. If it was within my power to give you good fatherhood, I would like to become that father for you, that father figure. I know you had a bad mom and a terrible upbringing. If it was within my power to somehow go back into your very soul and spirit and give you back the mom you really needed, I'd like to be that mom. See, blessings are pretty cool. Blessings require something. Blessings aren't just, oh, you need a new you know, starter for your car? Here, I'll fork out some money for it. And that, but that could be a blessing. It could go even a step further, like I could help you put that in your car. Blessings can be physical needs, but they can also be spiritual needs and emotional needs. Blessings could be, I know you have a need in your life, and if it's within my power to give it, I'd give it. But sometimes it isn't within our power to give it. Sometimes it's just something too big. It's too much. I can't give you freedom from your addiction. I can't give that to you. <sighs> oh, but wait, I have a God in heaven who can. I don't have the power to give you that blessing. But God has the power to give you that blessing, and I can pray that blessing over you. See, that's what the early church was doing. They were meeting every day, blessing each other every day in their prayers, sharing prayer requests with each other, discovering through prayer requests what the needs really were, and sometimes saying, well, gee, you need food. I I got some of that. Oh, you're without a tunic. I got an extra. And so they began doing this thing where they shared, and they gave blessings and all of that kind of stuff. They continually devoted themselves to these four things. Not just once in a while. The text said they continually devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, 
breaking of bread, and prayer. I submit, in my own life, I could look back and say, yeah, I don't know I ever went to church for any of those reasons. Uh, maybe apostles' teaching. I've looked for some good teaching pastor for. But really, and I look back, I just, or those four things what I was looking for in church? No, I was looking for how good's the music. Can the people sing? What's the room look like? And maybe the fellowship piece, because I've often done this. I know you do it too. I'm just kind of laying the cards on the table. Let's be truthful. You walk into a church, and partly what you decide if you want to stay there is you look around the room and you say, would I meet any of these people on a Friday night? And I've walked into some churches and gone, nope, right? So have you. I'm just being honest, right? You guys, you're not supposed to be honest that way in church. But it's truthful, right? That's, that's the real deal. So you look around the room and you say, would I be friends with any of these? Is there anybody in this room I'd hang out with on a Saturday, right? And the answer better be yes. If it isn't, you're probably in the wrong church. Because really, this is what we're talking to. Continually devote yourself to fellowship and intimacy, breaking of bread. You better look around the room and say, there's people here I'd be friends with. There's people here I'd go to dinner with on Friday night or Saturday, hang out with on a Saturday afternoon. There's people here I'd meet with and be offline with just, just for the sake of just knowing them because they're fascinated. I have the advantage, being the pastor of the church, that people come to me and talk to me. And I happen to know personally, for a fact, there are some incredibly fascinating people sitting in the room right now, right? And you, most of you don't know them. And I'm getting to know them. But they're really cool people. And the more they talk to me, the more I go, oh, this person's really cool. This person's got a great story. Man, we need to share that story. Man, more people need to know. I'd like to introduce this person to this person over here because there's some really cool people sitting in the room right now. And what Jesus is looking for us to do as a church is know that. Know that about each other. Not hear it second or third hand, but know it personally. Here's what's cool. When the early church devoted themselves to those things, those four things, they got six different results. And I love these results. Normally, I'm not a four things, six things guy. You know that. But this passage is just so rich that it has to be kind of broken out that way. Because they did those four things, here's the six results they got. Everyone was filled with awe, number one. Everyone was filled with awe. The real word there in the Greek word is phobos. Guess what word we get out of that? Phobia, yeah, fear. Everybody was freaking out. That's the first thing, because why? Because God was moving so much, so powerfully, in such wonderful, mysterious ways that everybody freaked out a little because they knew it was God. So if you're in a really good church where stuff's happening, God's moving, you should be freaking out a little bit. That's the first thing that should happen. The second thing was, it, said, it says here, that many wonders and signs were performed by the apostles. God's power was seen. Many signs, many wonders, many things where people would look at each other and say, well, that was God. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't, that's too big for us to pull off. Yeah, we couldn't have done that. Hey, that wasn't just coincidence. That had to have been God, you know. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. You have these conversations or people show up or things happen. And, you know, we had a guy visit our church a couple of weeks ago and we had, I had Mark Terrell sitting right here with a cup of cool water and there was a dude coming to our church because he went to his church and it was packed full and he couldn't get in. We had room. So he decided, well, I'll check that gathering house I've been meaning to for a year. He comes and he sits in this table right here. And for a year and a half, God's been telling him to get involved with a cup of cool water, but he hasn't been doing it. And guess who I have interviewed around that day? Oh, I have Mark Terrell, the leader of Cup of Cool Water, right here. And this guy, you think he didn't hear God's voice that day? He got kicked in the head by God, right? And there's stuff that happens where you say, once in a lifetime, and these are kind of strange things that other people say, well, that was a strange coincidence. There are no coincidences with God. And you know what? If you're in a really cool church where stuff happens, that should be commonplace. Everybody's got a story of how God moved and what God did, what God's doing now, what he just did, what he's doing now, and what you think he's about to do. That's a sign of when you're in a good church because God's moving. So they have the signs and wonders taking place. Sometimes they are miraculous healings. I've seen that, experienced that. Sometimes they're demonic deliverances. I've seen that experience. The next thing that happens, the third thing that happens there, it says, all the believers were together and had everything in common incredible sharing takes place. When you're doing the first four things right, one of the results is you get incredible sharing. Nobody in the church is needful. Nobody in the church is lonely. Nobody in the church is hungry. Nobody in the church goes without because you take care of each other. In the early church, they, you know, they were, all these people had come to Jerusalem for Pentecost. And that's supposed to be like a week-long festival. And they stayed for six months. So they lived in people's houses, they hung out, they were learning and all this kind of thing, and then they would scatter later. So it doesn't mean, oh, we're supposed to sell everything and live on a hippie commune and raise goats. No, no, no. That was just this is. But it does mean we better share with each other what we have. There are a bit of generosity and kindness. That's one of the results. The other result was this. I like this one. They sold property possessions to give to anyone who had a need. That's part of the incredible sharing. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. 
So they're meeting every day. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with gladness and sincere hearts. I love that part. Gladness and sincere hearts, you know what that means? It means people started getting authentic with each other. The joy was there. They were authentic. No more masks. No more playing the game. No more pretending I'm more than I am. We're doing this every day. I guarantee if you hang out with people long enough, eventually your stuff comes out, right? Eventually your stuff comes out, and you're like, oh, I didn't know you had that temper. Oh, I didn't know you would say words like that, or I didn't know, right? It's going to come out. So when they're with each other every day, this stuff starts coming out, and when it starts coming out, you begin dealing with it, but they stay together, they stay in the mess, and they're doing it with gladness and sincere hearts, which means we're authentic with each other, and we're still doing this journey together. People were becoming genuine. And then I like this. It says the fifth thing that happened, uh, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. That means their reputation of the church was growing good. It was getting high. It's getting better in society. People around them were like, oh, that church, those people who do that thing, they're really cool. In fact, our society needs those people. In fact, we should have more of that. Is that the reputation of the church today? <laughs> no, 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 no. It's not. When we bought this building and we put the sign up out front that said church, that almost killed our coffee shop, right? Can't get people to come in. Why? Because in small little print under the gathering house sign, it says a covenant church and cafe. A covenant church, right? That was, that was a covenant church. That one word church had hundreds of people say, I ain't going there. I had a guy, he's a friend of mine now. He actually owns about half this block here on this side going down that way. He told me, Rob, I was so mad when a church bought that anchor property in our neighborhood. I was just furious. But then he came and saw what we did. He goes, oh, I'm so glad you're, I'm so glad you're. I had one of the business people who in this neighborhood say, come and apologize to me after we had opened and opened about four or five months. And the business person said to me, I have to confess that I was so angry that a church bought that really cool property that I went around to the neighborhood and badmouthed you to the businesses trying to get you guys out, right? Not like they could have done anything. And that person asked for forgiveness. And actually now I would have to say, hands down, that business and its employees are our single biggest supporters in this neighborhood, right? When you're doing church right, it affects the community. When you're doing church right, your reputation and your favor grows. I hope... Those are signs that we're doing something right. And then the sixth thing was this. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. If we devote ourselves to those first four things, you know, that whole apostles teaching, fellowship, breaking bread and prayer. If we spend our energy saying, those are the things we're going to do. If we're going to try to do that together, we'll, we'll screw it up. We'll get it wrong. We'll make mistakes. You know, we, we don't, that's going to happen. That's okay. But if we can devote ourselves to that more and more and more, we'll get these six results. People should be freaking out. God's power will be seen. Incredible sharing will take place. We'll become genuine with each other. Our reputation and favor will grow in the community. And God will say, that's a church worth sending my people to. The church won't grow because we have a really cool marketing scheme and a fantastic plan to recruit people to come here because like some churches did that I read about, they were going to use Star Wars as their Christmas uh, series. You know, the Buddhist Star Wars theology is going to be your Christmas series. I don't understand that. It's not going to be marketing. It's going to be, you know what? God sends his children because he says, I trust the people in that church to take care of my little lamb, right? And you know what? If you're thinking, oh, that's your job, pastor. <laughs> that's not going to happen. I am going to let you down, right? If you think I can do it, I'm going to tell you right now, and those who know me really well can give you a hearty amen. I am going to let you down, and I'm going to screw it up, and we're doomed if you think it's on me. Doomed! It's on all of us. It's on all of us in this together. Those of us who are saying, yeah, I go to the gathering house. If you tell people when they say, you go to church anymore, and you say yes, they say, where do you go? If you say, I go to the gathering house. If those words come out of your mouth, then you know what God's asking you? He's asking you to do these things. He's asked you to experience these results. God's looking to you to be someone he could trust to send other people to, to nurture and love and care, care for. So we thought today, we're going to end about a half hour earlier than normal. We thought today what we do is, okay, let's start with breaking bread together, which means, you know, and just because we're going to eat soup together doesn't mean you're duty bound yet to protect each other with your life. We'll, we'll, worry. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that point someday. But if we could just eat a meal together, right? If we could sit at tables and talk and say hi to each other, if we could get to know each other a little bit, if we could sit at a table with someone we have not sat at a table with before, maybe even mix our families up and whatever and sit with different people, just have a bowl of soup, eat a little bread and say, hi, what's your name? That'd be a pretty good start, I think. So we thought, let's do that on this Sunday. That's why we didn't do the first service. We crammed us all in one because we didn't want to have two different groups doing this. We wanted us all to be one church. So we've got like, Eight kinds of soup in this room behind me with lots of bread. 
And I have no idea the mechanics of how we're going to do this, but Crystal does. Crystal does, and she's, where, is, where are you, Crystal? I don't, oh, she's probably in the back right now setting something up. So, uh, yeah, let's see about, go, go, what? Go in and see what Crystal's got going back there, Anika. And we're just going to have lunch together. And, of course, you're free to leave, you know. We'll just take your name as you're exiting out the door. <laughs> we won't do that. If you don't want to stay, that's cool. But in the end, here's the thing. To create the church that you really want to experience in your life, you got to put a little into it. You can't find it. You have to create it. If you are brand new here and you've never been in our church before, love having you here. Great. Thanks for coming. Stay for soup. Get to know you. If you never plan on coming back, that's fine too. The soup's free. The bread's free too. Hang out with us. We don't care. So everybody just goes back there, form a line, grab it, come back out, find a spot, mix and mingle, sit there. We'll probably put some chairs and tables up here. We need a little more chair and table. Room. Let's, let's sing a song together, and then we'll just say a prayer over the food, bless it, and let's just hang out with each other.